Hello everyone, welcome to the Legal 500 webinar series. My name is Zhao Bei. I'm the editor of the Legal 500 Asia Pacific Guide. We have a very special lineup today with senior partners from elite firms across China. Before we begin, a few notes regarding today's session. The webinar will last for an hour and it will be in English. Now please take your now, please take this opportunity to engage with, with our distinguished panel by sending in your questions through our Q&A box throughout the session. You can send your questions in Chinese or in English. We will do our best to address these at the end of the session. The session is recorded. Please do feel free to share the link with your colleagues once the video is available to view. In our, <clears throat> in our discussion today, we're delighted to welcome the panelists, Li Xiaoming Lu Shi of Hankun Law Offices, Tan Peng Lu Shi from Fonda Partners, and Dan Ouyang of Wilson Sonsini, Godwich, and Rosati. Tan Peng Lu Shi specializes in the areas of mergers and acquisitions, private equity investments, and general corporate and securities offerings. In particular, Pong has extensive experience in outbound investment by PRC companies in the US, Europe, Southeast, South, South America, and Asia. Dan Ouyang is a partner in the Beijing and Hong Kong offices of Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, where she leads the capital markets practice in the Greater China Group. Dan has extensive experience with US and Hong Kong equity offering, bond offerings, private equity and m and transactions. She has represented corporate clients across a range of industries, including TMT, healthcare and consumer in more than 100 IPOs and follow on offerings in the US and Hong Kong. Uh, Beijing based Li Xiaoming Lu Shi of Hankun Law Offices began his career with Debois and Plimpton in 1990. Before joining Hankun as a partner, Mr. Li was a partner and leader of uh, several important practice areas in China and international law firms. He has extensive experience in finance, mergers and acquisitions, capital markets, and cross-border dispute resolution, among other fields. Mr. Li has been recognized for many years as a top practitioner in China by the Legal 500 Asia Pacific. Thank you all for joining us today. Now, in today's session, we'll be hearing from the China market forecast, reflecting on China's zero COVID policy and its implications for law firms and business businesses, and discussing the changing role of Chinese national and international law firms in China market. Since China began to open up and reform its economy in 1978, GDP growth has averaged almost 10% a year and more than 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty. There have, have also been significant improvements in access to health, education, and other services over the same period. China is now an upper middle income country and is a growing influence on other developing economies through trade, investment, and ideas. Sectors such as copper mining, building construction, real estate, online shopping, Logistics, infrastructure, software are all some of, the mo some, some of the most important sectors in the current China economy. Many of the complex development challenges that China faces are relevant to other countries, including transitioning into a new growth model, rapid aging, building a cost-effective health system, and promoting a low carbon energy path. Now, I would like to invite our first panelist, Dan Ouyang to share some insight on the current China market and, and market forecast going forward. Please. Sure. sure. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Bei, to uh, invite me. Uh, I think I just uh, kick off the discussion at the uh, Li Lishi and Tan Lishi can supplement uh, their insight on this uh, uh, area. Uh, uh, for this year, um, uh, we actually have seen a very slow market uh, for the PMA. Uh, in the first half of this year in China and the Hong Kong market, uh, both inbound and outbound uh, transactions uh, due to the uh, you know, economic and regulatory uncertainties. 
uh, we have also noticed that there are quite a uh, US firm that have migrated uh, part of its operation from China to Singapore. Uh, uh, in the next few years, uh, we believe the volume of Southeast Asia uh, financing deal will increase as those firms look for opportunities in this area. Uh, for the IPO uh, uh, market, actually I'm an IPO practitioner, uh, despite the weak market performance at the beginning of this year, uh, but I, I think last year was a, a great year for IPO market. Uh, so I think each uh, significant player in the legal market uh, still has a, a certain number of, of ongoing deals, uh, both uh, Hong Kong and the US transactions. Uh, together with uh, stable demand uh, of US listed issuer uh, to list in Hong Kong uh, due to the geopolitical uh, uh, tension between US and uh, um, China. Uh, also, uh, we, we noticed starting from June, uh, we have seen an uh, uptick in uh, economic data in China. Uh, the Communist Party's congressional meeting uh, will also be held in October. Uh, so I think the market sentiment uh, at this point is that the market condition and regulatory environment uh, in China uh, will be significantly improved uh, after the meeting uh, as the uh, market stimulus package is expected to be launched. Uh, I also recently talked to uh, several banks and market players uh, recently. Uh, I think the market consensus is optimistic that next year's IPO shall be much better. Um, I think this is general consensus uh, right now. Uh, for the industry sector, uh, this is also uh, I think a uh, focal point, uh, I think within the uh, market uh, practitioners, uh, biotech and healthcare sector was a focus in the past two years, uh, partially due to the COVID impact. Uh, in the 2022, uh, the wave of uh, 18A pre-revenue biotech Hong Kong IPO uh, deals has receded and health deal, uh, healthcare deals that are recently announced uh, I think most deals are the company that already generated revenues. I think this is a, a significant change uh, in the market. Uh, for the tech sector, uh, uh, given the geopolitical tension between China and the US and, and also potential delisting pressures uh, due to the PCAOB audit inspection issue, uh, there are still a uh, wave of uh, the company that currently listed in NASDAQ or NYSE are seeking to list in Hong Kong. Uh, or doing a listing by introduction in Hong Kong. Uh, in this market, in this sector, we also expect that the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to implement new rules uh, to accommodate uh, uh, tech companies without revenue or profit uh, to list in Hong Kong. I think that will spark a new wave of tech boom in Hong Kong uh, in the following years. Uh, another significant uh, industry sector is the uh, consumer sector. Uh, that sector itself is actually not impacted by the regulatory environment and regulatory changes uh, in recent years, um, but it was a significant impacted by the economic condition uh, due to the lockdown and other related activities. Uh, that's why we also didn't see a lot of consumer deals that uh, went out this year. Uh, looking forward, I believe the market should only uh, go up from here uh, because I think it's already the bottom of the market. So uh, I think along with the economic recovery, uh, we would expect uh, m and and IPO uh, legal market next year to rebound as well. I think this is my uh, general uh, view at, at, at this point. Okay, um, and now uh, Xiaoming Li uh, and, and Peng Tan, would you like to contribute towards your observation of the general market and market forecast? Thank you, Zhao Bei, and thank you, Ouyang, for the wonderful uh, presentation. I just want to add some historical historical background, and just to put put things in, into a perspective. The COVID outbreak started in two thousand. And I, uh, 2000, uh, 2020, uh, 2020, and the entire country froze to a standstill. And I think we were so scared. We didn't know what to expect until around June, the market rolled back in vengeance. And I think 2020, 
I would say most firms in China had a good year. That good year continued. 2021, I think for most firms was a record year. Uh, I mean, we we have to look at you know we don't we need to separate uh, you know the, the the what changed in the markets how the COVID impact market what the geopolitical uh, you know uh, seismic changes have an impact on the market but I think 2021 was a record year for most firms. In fact, we had a hard time retaining our associates and senior lawyers. There was a huge migration from law firms. To in-house positions, and I, I'm sure this 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 I think this happened to found out as well at the top firms, and we had a hard time because the attorneys hours were so high. A lot of attorneys were averaging over two thousand hours a year, and it was a breakneck speed. And in fact, we a lot of people were, were reporting they they burned out. They had to change a different lifestyle. But this year is, again, is a very different year. And we are now at the midpoint of this year. I don't know how this year is going to pan out. And I think OEM painted a very good picture. I hope she's right. And we, we're going to have a good year, at, at, well, at least a relatively good year. But I think the first half of the year, if we look at the numbers, we were concerned. And we were quite concerned with the numbers, with, with the turning hours. And also build up, uh, also the the, the 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 level of activities. We we look at how many how many uh, 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 new entry and in, in, in new matters that we have reported, and how many hours attorneys have clocked, and to predict uh, what's going to happen from now on. And also we know what had happened since January one until the end of uh, the end of May, the, the first five months. The pictures was not was not pretty. Let me put it this way, and I think a lot many firms have started thinking if this continued, what we're going to do. Over back yeah. to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lidia. Sure. And um, um, I, I I really would like to share the the um, some of your views. It was interesting. I still remember the time that earlier last year. You know, we had to raise our uh, associate salary uh, in order to retain the talents. Um, yeah, it was true. It, it was very interesting that um, you know every year when our firm was was making uh, trying to formulate our budget at the beginning of the year, we were pessimistic. We were pessimistic last year in 2021, but in the end, um, we 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 had a very good year. That that was very surprising to us. But I have to agree that this year is, is very different. Um, we are very pessimistic, um, at least for this year's um, uh, economic outlook. Um, but I, I think for almost uh, for most of the law firms on the market, um, what is actually taking the hits are, are you know capital market VC PE investment for sure. Um, but if you look at other sectors or if you look at other practice areas. Such as litigation um, and uh, compliances, they are actually extremely busy. Um, well, they are busy, of course, for for two reasons: because of the um, increasing demand um, and from clients, you know, during during this kind of um, time, it's just easier for them to actually get into disputes and also the um, the, the because of the 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 many um, laws that the uh, U.S. and other countries have issues that which have an impact on some of the Chinese enterprises. For example, the, the recent UFLPA, um, which basically means that you know our compliance team is is, is going to have a, a quite busy period, I think, for the rest of the year. So I think for for most of the law firms or the food service law firms, um, the impact should be limited. Um, I do think that the you know this year we're looking at a, a, a very peculiar situation where a lot of factors are actually commingled together to to make the market like this, right? The the COVID, the, the stringent um, COVID zero policy, um, the Ukraine Russian war, and a lot of the regulatory um, regulatory policies that were taken this year. 
Um, but I, I do, um, one thing I do agree with Zhou Yang, I think at least personally, I'm confident that the, in terms of the, a lot of the um, regulatory moves, um, hopefully I think that the, the government or the Chinese government will actually change course um, in the second half of the year. Um, when they actually see that the e economy actually needs some incentives um, so that they can bounce back. Um, and, you know, at least based on, you know, what we have been experiencing, um, the efficiency of the Chinese government, I think um, hopefully we will be able to actually see something bouncing back. Um, even though I, I, I highly doubt that, you know, uh, by the end of the year, we'll look at, you know, overall a good year, but, um, um, but uh, let's just say that you know like we, we should stay positive. Yeah. Thank you very much for everyone uh, um, who have contributed towards the uh, the first topic point. Um, what I would also like to kind of find out from you is that, for example, in other practice areas such as uh, intellectual property, um, and maybe uh, like uh, Paul mentioned. Um, <clears throat> litigation dispute resolution uh, and maybe restructuring as well these these must be areas that might have increased or, or haven't really seen as much change as um, uh, as you would see in the in the transactional space in MA space or PEVC space so I'm just wondering whether you can share some lights on that and also looking forward in in the next year also what industry sectors would you see that looks promising or looks like they, they will be growing? I probably, I think our uh, partners report that the IP and also IP litigation are among the least affected by the COVID situation and the current geopolitical uh, 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 volatilities. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to, to, to speculate on the personal reason, but I think the mere fact, I mean, I think you would agree, and the mere fact there are some, you know, top IP lawyers changing firms suggest there is a market for it. And in fact, the market is quite good. Otherwise, if the market is flat out bad across the board, you wouldn't see you know, the, 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 the drastic changes of top lawyers from one firm to another. Because we have now seen, for, for example, we have now seen uh, uh, capital market talents or general corporate talents changing firms that much. That's one way of looking at the market to see where the talents are going and why they are going. And I think the, the I think the person, you know, the, the personal, you know, frictions. I I, I always discount that uh, as important as important. It, it, it is a factor, but without the high market demand, there cannot cannot simply cannot be a change that easy. Yeah, yeah, fully agree, fully agree. And 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 also other than IP litigation, I think as as they mentioned. The other area that is um, quite notable in terms of this performance is actually restructuring, um, bankruptcy and restructuring. Uh, of course, I mean, this, this practice always benefits from an economic downturn, right? But um, it's, it's really, but in the Chinese market, I think uh, it's actually has been, there has actually has been um, an accumulated number, a large number of cases or bankruptcy cases um, that has been accumulated over years. And now it's actually taking time for them to, for the government and for the court to actually process. So that part of the practice is actually the, uh, we expected it to be very active um, for many years as well, yeah. Um, and in terms of the government targeted initiatives, such as um, Belt and Road Initiative, such as the um, Greater Bay Area Development, um, would you see those initiatives picking up a bit more in, in the next next few years? Uh, me, I was the head of Belt and Road uh, at Whiting Cage when I was there. 
and I, I served in that position for a number of years. I personally feel, you know, we had a, a huge practice then, uh, helping a lot of Chinese companies going abroad uh, on, the, on the strength of Chinese finance. Uh, you know, the, the export credit finance, as well as product finance, because a lot of these are high, high ticket item requires a lot of money and they require a lot of bank finance. But I think, you know, in the current uh, economic and political environment, banks, my view, are more careful uh, lending money. Uh, uh, both a reflection of getting prepared for what's going to happen, and also a reflection of the geopolitical changes, because whether or not the investment is still welcome, whether or not the investment is part of the is subject to sanctions, whether or not the, uh, the, the investment Belt and Road uh, will conflict with other interests, but I think the uh, the stakeholders are are, <clears throat> are banking. So I think uh, you know the I have now seen a huge uptick in the Belt Road Initiative, but I think it's going to continue. Uh, I'll make no mistake, it's going to continue. It's not only a national policy, but also I think a lot of Chinese companies have high stake in, uh, in, in, those, in, in the investment of those countries, not only for their own uh, survival, but also for their own market share. So I think it's going to stay. And, uh, put national interests aside. I mean, I, because that, that's not something lawyers worry about. I think to look at the, what drives them go to other countries. And I think one, you know, historically, number one was the oversupply. The, the oversupply a lot of stuff in this country, like for the iron, steel, cement, what have you. You know, also the construction company, they needed a newer, you know, greener fuel, the, the new market to expand, to serve their own interests. Uh, and then some of the things, you know, you know, remain stable, but some of the factors have changed. So I, I, as of today, I, you know, I talk to my bank friends and, and other friends. Uh, their lending activities are much slower than before. One point, you know, one, one, one case in, in point. Uh, for, for example, in the UK, in the, uh, China was part of the uh, nuclear power plant. But because of the changes in the UK policy and also I think a geopolitical thing, you know, chances are I think China will pull its investment out of the, the nuclear power plant. And that nuclear power plant was not only Chinese investment, but also bank road by Chinese money. That's very interesting. Um, no, I think um, when we talked about the general market trends and where the market is heading, you know, we mentioned about we we can't avoid not mentioning about the COVID impact and the geopolitical impact um, that China, China is, China and, and other countries are experiencing. No, I think uh, both of uh, all of you mentioned that there. 2021 has been a good year and 2022 started off very strong. Um, however, these uh, unexpected lockdown in China, particularly in Shanghai, has impacted uh, quite severely uh, the, 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 the economy, at least temporarily. So I, I'm, I, I, want, uh, I want to see whether uh, Li Lushi, Xiaoming Lushi, whether you can expand on how, how the COVID restriction be impacting the delivery of the service and the management of the firm last year and this year. Well, I mentioned uh, when I was making comments on Ouyang's uh, uh, description, I think if you single out, if you isolate COVID and, and look, at it, look at it as a single factor impacting on legal activities, I think the impact is somewhat uncertain because 2020 was a good year for a lot of firms. 2021, the COVID continued, we, a lot of firms had a record. Uh, I think going forward, I think obviously Shanghai and Beijing, what happened in Shanghai and Beijing, uh, according to Chinese official, was a turning point because I, I just mentioned uh, be, before the, the conference, I attended a global act, COVID exit conference uh, hosted by, uh, WHO attended by a, you know high powered uh, 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 medical uh, experts uh, uh, around the world. 
the message that I got from that thing was um, COVID is going to stay with us. And I think we just need to manage the impact, particularly the death rate uh, uh, caused by, by COVID. If the death rate is manageable, my sense is, you know, over time, you know, the policy will continue to be relaxed as we, we just saw yesterday and China published the ninth uh, protocol for the COVID, dealing with COVID situation. And I, I, I fully expect the, the situation will continue to be relaxed, but I'm more concerned about the geopolitical situation because if you look at the inflation, if you look at the war, if you look at the, you know, the, 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 the seismic changes of the, the government policies around the world, I think we are we may heading into something even worse than uh, 2008 uh, global recession, global financial recession. If that's the case, I think be, remember uh, when the recession hit the, the the world, several practice sectors were wiped out. For example, structure finance. I was part of structure finance team too myself. So I, I, although I didn't do a lot of structured finance, basically structured finance, basically in other words, derivatives, that practice was gone. And even 13 years, 13, 14 years after 2008, that practice had not come back in, in the way that we understood that practice used to be, what, what practice used to be. I mean, going forward, looking at what our practice areas are, my feeling is if 2008 is a mirror, I think it's, we are likely to see the, the, the PBC transactions, which are structured for yield only, will be affected big time. Unless the transactions have strong underlying projects, which promise good returns. In other words, if the deal is structured for yield only, only for money chasing others' money, that kind of transactions will, I think, fade away. My feeling uh, part is 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 not only partly because is, is partly because of the the changes, and also partly because of the government drive to push the money to support real economy. But we all know real economy takes much longer term for return than other type of economy, than the virtual economy. So that's why I think it, it, I, I, you know, every day I look at our new matter entries. I, I see there's, you know, what I just said has some, some support in what uh, our new matter entry seem to suggest. That's my, my general view. So structured, the uh, transaction structure for yield only. Well, I think Ouyang, you, 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 your firm is, is an expert in, in, that, in that space. You may probably, you, you may have something to add. I just, my, my personal observation, looking at you know, Han Gun's number, looking at our, what our attorneys are busy doing. Yeah, um, actually, I, I think um, I didn't experience uh, so many downturns as uh, 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 Li, Li Lushi, uh, but I think uh, in my limited uh, period of uh, several downturns, um, because I, I think last year, uh, around the end of the year, I, I think um, the IPO, we, we already have actually lots of IPOs. Uh, everyone knows that uh, last year was a record year. Uh, for every IPO law firm. Uh, but I was uh, thinking at that time that maybe next year wasn't a great year. So around the end of uh, last year, I start to uh, I mean, do more uh, BD activities and uh, collect more deals. Um, so I think this year so far, uh, our deals is uh, uh, our general performance is uh, okay. Uh, but as a as, um, Everyone ex expected and predicted. I think if the market uh, doesn't um, get better uh, in the second half, especially if uh, 
doesn't get better after the congressional meeting, then I think every law firm in the market might have uh, issues. Um, Tanishi, would you like to share your, your um, insight on that one as well? Um, yeah, sure. I do. Um, um, I do agree with you on, on this um, behavior of the practice, especially on the um, because I, I remember uh, earlier this year that when there was a period of time when the the uh, Chinese stocks actually listed in the U.S., the, 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 there was a huge decrease. And one of the one of the PE investor was making the comment that Chinese stocks are no longer investable. Um, I, I think when he when he was talking about no longer investable, he was talking about that golden period where PEMVC fund can put money into a TMT company and then they see like um, you know um, 100 times kind of return in a very short period period of time without doing anything. Right, just the, the the market just is just just running on themselves. Um, I agree that those kind of deals, um, you, you're not going to see that kind of deals anymore on the market. Now, um, recently, when when um, I, I I noticed something that some of our PE clients, when they come to us, and and when they are talking about valuation, um, they are looking at the the fundamentals. They are even looking at PE multiples. If you remember the issue, yeah, there was this um, during the past uh, many years, some of the VC fund when they invest, the valuation was not based on you know any solid calculation or financial performances, right? Not to mention anything about multiple. There was there was no P multiples. It was just number. Um, but now the 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 PE funds are looking at something much more fundamental and they're comparing that to public market in in Asia. And they are looking at more public deals because the public deals are actually uh, much more predictable in terms of valuation. Um, so I, we, yeah, we'll see that the, the change of the mentality of the, of the clients. Um, but overall, I think that's actually a, a good uh, that's a good trend because that that makes sure that you know the the kind of deals that will be closed on the market these days um, will be more solid than before. And the lawyers are uh, are are going to spend more time on negotiating um, terms and conditions that will be more you know um, practical to the clients. So um, I, I I do uh, I think in a way this is this is actually a good change um, for for the industry. Okay. Temple, I think I think Temple, I think you are absolutely correct because what you described is also what we experienced. You know these hyper uh, activities and looking for high yield. They look don't they don't bother to look at the fundamentals. This is exactly what happened when I was in Hong Kong uh, around 25 years ago, around the Hong Kong return to to China. At the time, I was representing Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. The joke on uh, in in the market was. You just you just use a piece of paper, write China. Everybody is going to buy. You don't have to worry about what the paper actually represents. It was so true. It was so mad, so crazy. And then the market crashed around, I think, uh, 1997, 90, 90, 90, uh, uh, 1998, crashed miserably and didn't return. But that was that represented. A, a, a craziness of the market at the time. So my client was saying, Xiaoming, rush, rush, rush. Just get the document done because if you write China, everybody's going to buy. Don't worry about the rest. Yeah. Um, so now, I mean, if we shift the discussion point a little bit towards kind of client facing um, side, it, during the pandemic, obviously, what, especially, especially um, during the lockdown, meeting clients has been particularly difficult. And even in the past two years, um, it has been difficult to travel in and out of the country. So how do you as a firm to each of the panelists um, cope with such situation? And what were the consequences of such situation for you, for you in terms of dealing, um, kind of 
liaise with the clients uh, when pre-pandemic you had a lot of faith maybe face-to-face meetings or meeting clients in different countries and that that's that's all kind of changed all of a sudden I mean, I think, let, let me just, you know, uh, uh, jump in. I think our first priority is to save our talent uh, because the only, you know, assets we have is our attorneys, our, our, because they have suffered through the pandemic. They have suffered from the ups and downs of business activities. And in fact, uh, during the uh, Shanghai lockdown, we actually invited a, uh, a, a expert in psychoanalysis just to make sure that our, our people have psychological health. Just talk to them, because that's that's something we worry we worry quite a bit. Because if we lose talents, we lose everything. And and if history is any uh, any guidance, I mean, as Ouyang said, I I hope you know I hope she's right. And we have touched the bottom. We cannot go further down anymore, which means we have to go up. If we go up, we have no talents, we are finished. So I think the, the top thing that we do, you know, this, this you know, permeates into a number of things. When to raise our compensation, how much we're gonna pay for, I don't know, a bonus. And we have a look at what other firms are doing and why they are doing it. And we have to, we have to, uh, uh, to recruit in certain areas, probably in priority and over other areas. These are the things we, we constantly talk about and we, we, we meet regularly. I think the, the, the fundamental uh, thing for us is to make sure that the talents stay with us, with us. Mm-hmm. And Talisha, you mentioned earlier that during the pandemic, in order to retain some of these uh, young talent, you you firm considered raising salaries uh, for for them as well. And apart from that, are there any any other approach you took to make sure that the young talented lawyers within the firm stays with the law firm and and are happy doing what they're doing during the difficult time? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Because uh, just offering money wouldn't be enough. Um, the what well, well, we, for example, during the Shanghai lockdown, we did exactly the same thing as what Han Kun did, and uh, we actually formed like a specialized team, a task force, um, to come up with all kinds of activities, online activities, um, forming online clubs for the associates, uh, like dancing clubs, yoga clubs, you know, uh, all kinds of clubs for them. Just to make sure, you know, when they stay at home, they, they can feel that they are being taken care of and, and the firm actually care for them. Um, that's actually quite important. That That's more important. That can provide more value than money. Um, and, uh, but when you, you look at the, the client side, I, I have to say, I think, well, everybody is facing the same situation right now. We're, we're moving, we're shifting to more, you know, online meetings, less travel and that probably make it less um, make it even more efficient but still um, I think in terms of um, procuring you know you know new clients um, the face-to-face meeting actually is so important so we do expect I mean when this COVID situation is more relaxed um, the lawyers will become busy again traveling um, that will definitely come back um because this is just human nature um so uh, I, I think i think um COVID may actually have some impact on our performance for a period of time but uh, in the long term um yeah i think the impact is, is going to be limited yeah Okay, thank you. And oh, Yang uh, are you able to share some thoughts as well? And I know from previously the uh, previous discussion that you you actually uh, currently are traveling. So uh, I'll be quite keen to kind of find out from you as a, as a US firm based in China, um, what is the firm's kind of a strategy and instructions different or, or in line with what the Lucia and Tanisha has discussed? Uh, I, I think we have the similar situation here as well. 
uh, especially uh, actually um, like uh, for example our capital market practice uh, in Asia focused on uh, Hong Kong and US IPOs and IPO activities uh, usually uh, like partners need to travel a lot uh, for those uh, deal making and other things uh, for uh, this year I, th I think I usually and in the past seven years I usually travel uh, 100 times a year at least 100 times a year uh, but uh, this year, I think I probably travel like 20 times. Uh, I, I think it's um, already probably uh, a lot for uh, for a lawyer this year. Uh, but I think it does impact our business activities. Uh, so uh, with the lockdown uh, uh, gets lifted, I'm hoping that we can increase our business activities in the second half. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, right, I think finally, um, we, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that we have both um, two leading Chinese law firms and, and, and a US firm participating in this discussion today. So, so I'd like to shift, <clears throat> shift the discussion to the key kind of the, the key players in the, in the China legal market. Um, and obviously we know China's in, immense legal market is very competitive, fast moving, and there are a large number of UK, US, European firms. Uh, with offices in China, in Beijing and Shanghai, uh, as well as a vast number of outstanding PRC firms. Um, now China, uh, as we know for, for, for US firms or for, for international firms represents enormous possibilities, uh, but also there are also limitations as well. Uh, and, and the China, uh, country's strict national regulations continue to prevent foreign firms from achieving both their desired position in the marketplace and the com a company's profit. So to understand the, the position of both international firms and the PRC firms in China and the change, perhaps maybe the changing position of both types of firms, um, I'm inviting um, Tan Lushu to first share your thoughts uh, uh, on this point. And I obviously will be very welcoming Li Lushu and Ouyang Lushu to, to share their thoughts as well afterwards. Okay, thank you, Zhao Bei. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a quite interesting topic. Obviously, the international firms and, and the PRC firms, um, they are very different in many aspects, right? Um, but but we're, I don't think we, we, we want to spend time on explaining their traditions and history and management style. Uh, what I want to share is actually a quite interesting observation. Um, um, to, to start with the international firms, we see that international firms are, are Splitting or dividing into two groups. One, I think there is a there is a group who um, no longer sees China as a strategic point, um, where maybe they are not optimistic about Chinese market. So they are either closing down their offices or they are reducing the number of employees here um, to save costs and uh, to um, for those who are still staying. Um, they are actually trying to maybe just to observe for a while what's going to happen to China and then decide what to do. Um, but then the second group of international firms, um, uh, I think particularly those, 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 very, um, those, those that are remaining who are very strong in different practices, they are actually trying to expand and try to be more localized. Um, as some of you know, that the Ministry of Justice actually is to ban international firms from practicing pure laws. Um, but then the, until very recently, I mean, they, they relaxed the rules. Um, now they are allowing that the international firms to actually form alliances um, with PRC firms. So they kind of opened the door halfway just a little bit um, to, to, to allow the international firms to get into the um, PRC legal market or, or PRC law legal market. Um, and, and I know that many of the UK firms especially and some of the US firms, they are, they are already in process of, um, they have opened up offices or they are in the process of doing that. Um, so that's, that's one point the observation about the international firms. But then on the other hand, if you look at the domestic firms, um, most of the, the big players on the market, they are actually trying to become more um, internationalized. I mean, th this is when, when I say internationalized, this is not just purely limited to 
um, geographic expansion. Um, because, I mean, for example, there are firms like Kian and Wood. Um, they, their business goal is to really become uh, a firm with big international network. Um, that's their strategy, but it doesn't really work for other firms. Um, for for us, like Fonda, we have always been, we, we just want to focus on Chinese and Hong Kong law. Um, we have no plan to open up international offices. Um, but at the same time, the, the way how we want to become more internationalized is really to improve, um, you know, to catch up with the international firms on the learning skills, uh, IT infrastructure, you know, the talents in every way. We're, we're trying to become better. Um, of course, there's still a big gap there. Um, but we do believe that we should actually try to um, keep up doing a better job doing, uh, being at a higher level. Um, but then I, I think some of the firms, we know that they are actually looking at um, opening up international offices such as Singapore um, and, uh, and, and maybe try to, to become more internationalized that way. Um, and it will be interesting to see. So. I think I think the the basically the international firms and the PRC firms are competing more directly right now. Um, the it, it's uh, it's also no longer the area the, the era that when um, people actually have a a, a line of uh, practices that some of them are actually good. Um, for example, international firms are, are better at this. Um, but the PRC firms are not. Now it's all commingled together and, and, and um, all the firms are competing um, in the, in, 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 at the even level. So this is, this is one interesting observation that we have here. So I, I, um, so I, I actually have you know, some questions for Ouyang and for you here about you know, what's in some city um, plan. I mean, in China, are you, are you, do you want to become more localized? And, and for Hong Kong, we, we understand Hong Kong has always been very aggressive in their expansion and, and, and they are also looking at international market. And I, I definitely look forward to, to hearing some insight from uh, Mr. Lee as well. Ilishin, over to you. I think we might have temporarily lost Li Li Shi. Um, um, Ouyang Li Shi, would you like to share your thoughts? Sure. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with uh, um, Tan Li Shi. I actually, I'm a firm believer that the PRC law firm are the future of this market. Uh, I think PRC uh, law firm, I think one big thing is like, I think PRC law firm have significant cost advantage compared to international law firms, especially US law firms. Uh, given the different uh, cost structure, international law firms are forced to focus on a handful of practice areas. Uh, for example, uh, like PRC, uh, like IPO practice that has significant and profitable. Uh, in the past uh, 10 years, uh, actually uh, as a uh, you know, head of capital markets, and also I think in my whole career, I stay uh, in the international law firm. Uh, I have seen like a PRC law firm gradually took the space of international law firms, uh, starting from a foreign direct investment practice, uh, PE M&A practice, and now Hong Kong IPO practice. So without cost ad advantage, I think the international law firms strategy uh, in this market uh, should be uh, increase the depth of our practice. Uh, that means I think we should focus on the legal product expertise and industry knowledge. Um, uh, as a head of the capital markets in Asia, I believe, uh, I think the only thing we can do is uh, to stay close with the market and capture the latest market trend, uh, leverage our uh, global presence. Um, I think, for example, Wilson Sanxi is uh, famous uh, for its uh, tech practice. Uh, I think we need to uh, know the industry uh, and, and find a good company earlier than uh, the domestic competitors so that we can uh, compete in this market. Uh, I think uh, regarding the uh, localization, uh, the thing is, I think uh, we try to have a, like a, 
a multiple layer the uh, cost structure like we uh, other than uh, the associate we have a, a legal consultant uh, that cost structure and special associate uh, cost structure uh, but overall i think our cost structure is still uh, much higher than the uh, like uh, local law firms uh, so I, I think we should find uh, different strategies. And also, I think diversification is also important. Uh, for example, this year, everything, every, everyone is saying like capital markets is, uh, uh, is pretty bad. Uh, but I think our, uh, our practice is still quite okay uh, because we have a diversified uh, uh, products. Uh, like uh, on the US side, we have US IPO, uh, US BAC, and we have US compliance and other related program. Uh, on the Hong Kong side, we have uh, like Hong Kong uh, IPO and, uh, you know, uh, going private. And also we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, recently we have a uh, uh, Hong Kong SPAC. Uh, so I think if we have a uh, sufficient diversification, uh, we should uh, definitely find and survive in this market. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, uh, and I also wanted to, uh, to well, we wait, we wait for uh, Lilisha to rejoin us, hopefully. Um, I also have a couple of questions which were uh, raised by some of the um, uh, audience previously. Oh, I think Lilisha has joined. Sorry, I, I, I think our, our system was a little uh, mischievous today. And I think we just lost I lost everybody. No problem at all. I think in the past couple of years, we've, we're all used to suddenly yeah. the line dropped off and, and, and the panelists reappearing again. So yeah. I, yeah. Um, yeah. not a problem at all. Um, Lidusha, I don't know whether you heard um, the last bit of what Hanusha had said. He was mentioning about um, the kind of the strategy of the international firms and local firms and some of the local firms expanding outside China, um, such as Singapore, or, or I know many firms have, have already established a quite good offices in Hong Kong. So uh, Tan Lushi was kind of asking uh, Ouyang Lushi and, and yourself, just on a general point, what, what's your firm's strategy in terms of um, um, de developing your firm, both in, in the China market and beyond? I think the strategy, I mean, there are several facets, several uh, points about strategy, but I think the fundamentally, we follow our clients. Uh, we, you know, we, we serve, you know, the serving service of our clients is, is our primary goal. And the question is uh, whether or not we should open a, another new office, either in China or overseas, would better serve our clients' interests. And this is something we, we need to decide. I think the, uh, the question is whether or not we should have a yet another foreign office. Uh, uh, is is always up there, and fundamentally there are two strategies uh, in terms of opening an office. Number one is proactive. You know, you want to make sure that the, the new office would generate enough business, not only to serve to to make sure that office is viable, but also to serve home office. Second is defense, and if the clients go if, if the clients go out. And you, you, you want to make sure that the clients will not, you know, get too comfortable in a foreign jurisdiction with other service providers and to the oblivion of the home office of Hankui. You know, we just want to make sure we, we are still in their mind, in their hearts and minds, you know, when, when they go abroad. I mean, is it just, it, it, there's never a, a what is absolutely correct, what is absolutely wrong. I mean, it's, it's always always a way of making sure that clients are uh, uh, well served. At the same time, you know, or we have enough talent, we, not, we, we have enough talent to serve them. And also, and not only to have talent and retain talents to serve them, and also I think at what cost. I think, you know, the, 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 the I'm sure that uh, you know other offices, you know, particularly international firms, uh, you know, have have this. You want to have talents. You also want to retain talents in a foreign jurisdiction. That's a challenge for 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 a lot of us because we can probably hire them, but if they don't have enough deal flow, if the flow of business is not something the talents want to do. 
then we may we, are, we run the risk of losing them. Uh, 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 talking about the clients, I was managing White and Key's China operation for 12 years. One fundamental change. The moment I arrived at Whiting Case, most of our clients became Chinese. Chinese clients. Because they needed our service much more than other clients. Because the foreign clients in China, they, they know what to do. They always, have, they, they always have great Chinese firms serving them. And I think for, I mean, at the end of the day is competition. Who has what talents to serve the client? And, uh, and, and where. So I think we are looking at situation very closely and where clients are going and why they are going and what they want to do in, in, in other jurisdictions and to see whether or not that would justify a, a, a new office near where they are. Okay, Tan, do you, uh, Tanishi, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to say, I think Lili Shi brought up a very good, um, uh, another point, uh, which, which uh, I, I want to share, uh, which is the difference between the international firms and, and, the, uh, and, and the PRC firms. It is, um, it's also about, um, it, it's about the, the relationship between the clients and, and, the, and the firms. So I, I think one big issue um, that the PRC firms right now ha is having now are having now it is actually um, is to form a more solid and institutionalized relationship with their clients. This, this is actually extremely difficult. Um, you can see some of the international firms, I mean, they have institutional relationship with certain clients because they have been serving them for decades, right? I mean, that's, um, and, and they completely trust the firm to such extent that they are willing to exclude the other, um, the other players on the market, even, even though they may be able to actually serve at a, at a fair price or even quality. Um, and, and I think this is, this is something that the, the PRC firm with the past 30 years history has not been able to actually do very successfully yet. It's, it's, it's not really just purely the, the firm's issue. I mean, the, 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 the clients, I think even from the culture or even our, uh, for example, our uh, regulatory perspective, some of the clients are forced to actually choose, you know, service providers through an auction process. I mean, that, that makes it more difficult um, for the firms and, and the clients to actually bond together. Um, so, um, and then that, so that is, that is also one of the fundamental issues um, that the Chinese Firm to be looking at and, and see how they can actually tackle it. Um, because only if you have a, a loyal client and, and with that kind of relationship, we will be able to actually follow them to the international market. Um, because otherwise, you're just competing. In China, you're competing with other PRC firms. But for example, if you go to Singapore, you're competing with Singapore firms. Um, and that, that will be actually going to be an uphill battle um, for, the, for the firms who actually want to get into the international market. Okay, and, and just, just one, uh, one question in regards to the international firms and, and PRC firms. Now, even, even among the international firms, we now have a, a kind of more legal arms of the accountancy firms. And how do you think those types of firms are developing in the China market. We see, for example, in, in our legal 500 research, where we research the UK market, there is European markets, they're getting more and more prominent in, in, in the market in different jurisdictions. So I'd quite like to hear your thoughts on, on their development in, in the China market. Uh, Jobe, you're talking about the legal arms of the account of the big four accounting firms. Yeah. Um, the actually they, they were they were forced to close down um, um, starting from last year yeah this is this is a um, um, this actually came directly from the Ministry of Justice um, that they will not allow any foreign firm to control um, to have control um, in a Chinese firm um, so this is this is very uh, 
you can see this as, as very upfront. Uh, it's a very sudden change, but actually it's not. I mean, I think the Chinese government has been thinking about this for a long term. Um, and uh, I, I have even actually um, heard on the market right now that um, um, people are thinking of, you know, taking over some of the Chinese arms of the accounting firms. Um, so that they, they can be controlled by the Chinese instead of the other way around, um, but for them to actually control a Chinese firm. So at least I think in the short term, um, the Ministry of Justice is not going to relax that. You know, it's going to be very hard for them to have a legal arm that will survive in China. Well, even before uh, their shutdown, uh, I personally never thought the legal arms you know, of the accounting firms in China was a real competition for a couple of reasons. Number one, their internal conflict was so complex, which made it so difficult for them to get into our space quickly and effectively. That's number one. Number two, uh, even before they were, they, they were shut down, a number of the legal arms of accounting firms came and talked to us and thinking of joining us. We learned from them that the legal work they did there was not the type of work they wanted to do. You know, they, they felt it was, it was, it was, was not a high echelon, you know, not high profile enough for them to, to shine as a legal, uh, legal uh, you know, top lawyers. And so, and they, they have a personal frustration there, and, uh, apart from conflict of interest, but also the type of work they were able to do at the accounting arms, at the legal arms of accounting firms. So I think, you know, you know, obviously they were being shut down was a political decision, but from the economic analysis, uh, you know, I, I don't want to put down anyone, but but uh, it was really, you know, we were thinking about Thunga all the time, not the, the legal arms of the county firms uh, as, a, as a, a real competition or a real challenge um, to what we do. Seriously, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be, you know, you know, recently uh, uh, some of the accounting, uh, legal arm of the county firm joined us. They joined our Shanghai, Shanghai office. And mm -hmm. so we, we, will, we will have a daily dialogue about what they did then and what they want to do now. So I, this is how I, this is how I feel. Um, and I think just fi uh, uh, finally, I, I have a, a, another question in regards to kind of the, the lawyer moves with, uh, within the international firms, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in, in the past couple of years, we've noticed that many foreign registered lawyers have departed China and perhaps Hong Kong to either their home country or, or to, to jurisdictions such as Singapore. And, and earlier, Ouyang Lishi briefly mentioned that could be um, depending on the strategy of the firm, whether they, they're focusing on more market in Asia. Um, but I, I, I wonder whether you can also say, share some thoughts on what else could be driving such a shift, um, both either on a personal reason or on a kind of firm, firm wide reason. Sure, I, I think I just I just mentioned we have seen um, a, a wave of a uh, U.S. firm that uh, have migrated its operation from China to Singapore, uh, maybe elsewhere, maybe Europe or elsewhere. So we are also looking because uh, I think as Xiaoming uh, just uh, point out, which is the the bigger the most important strategy for all the law firms is just to follow the client. Uh, so uh, right now we also look at the Singapore market, so uh, and also other uh, potential markets. But if I think uh, people they move to other places, uh, at legal talents as well as uh, they are good fit for us, I think we are totally fine. Uh, actually, I think uh, I'm at right, right now. I'm in the U.S. Now I think most of the U.S. law firm, uh, their office, it, it, they open their office, but uh, people still. Uh, sort of uh, in a work from home mode. Uh, so I, I think and the location of the, the talents and also important uh, lawyers, I think that's not that important for us. Uh, we can always manage to accommodate uh, the location uh, issue. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah. Okay. Um, I think mm -hmm. that's probably uh, covers everything we wanted to cover today. Um, I, I, um, I, I think we're just a few minutes uh, over over the time, but I think, like I mentioned at the beginning, the webinar will be uh, uh, will be uh, available to watch on our website on demand. So, for example, if any of the um, audience who wish to raise any questions, and I hope it will be okay for for me to direct the question to to the panelists after the webinar, if that's okay. Um, and and um, for now, I would like to just thank everybody who have made the discussion possible and very interesting to be part of. I would like to thank those who have sent uh, who have sent us questions before before the, um, the, the the webinar, as well as our great panelists, Tan Lushu from Fonda Partners, Ouyang Lushu from Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Ros Rosati, and Li Xiaoming Lushu from. Hankun Law Offices for your insight and comments today. Um, please do, like I said, please do share the link with anyone who is interested. Oh, uh, um, and I look forward to speaking with all of you in the future. For now, um, thank you very much and bye. <laughs>